So I need to ask some questions first, but I need to make sure we denoise the data. So um, I need everyone to put their hand up. Everyone. I'm watching you. If you don't, I'll make a fool of you. Okay, good. Now, um, leave your hand up if you're a designer and put your hand down if you're not. Okay, so, okay. Now, who else is here? Is, is there, do we have developers? Okay, cool. Designer and developer. Wow, cool. There's a few of those. Uh, project manager. Okay, or product manager. Okay, cool. So I'm going to tailor the talk a little bit more in the product space um, because we have more designers and product people. Um, but before I get started, I need you to do a little experiment. I need you to look at the person next to you and say nothing and try not to smile. Do everyone do it. Yeah. That's really creepy. Um, normally, normally uh, it's really hard, but I think because we're in Germany, everyone's really good at being <laughs> like... <laughs> okay. Yeah, so now I've learned something about, about you guys. Um, uh, this, this slide is really, really dear to me because I studied archaeology and uh, early stone tools. I've given this talk before and I'm changing it a little bit, so if I'm repeating myself, um, I'm sorry if, if you've heard it before, but I'm, I'm really interested in this, this new intersection between the present and the future because um, at the moment we're all zombies and we're all staring at our devices. Um, and it's important if we're making new products that we try to understand uh, first where we came from. So I wanted to be an archaeologist and that's what I studied. I studied stone tool technology and how stone tools proliferated themselves across the earth. And it turns out that human beings do this because we like being nice to each other and smiling at each other and it's to uh, reinforce the pack mentality it's also why we get along really well with dogs we couldn't write any of this stuff down so the way that the technology like moved from the south of africa and nigeria which was the table of all mankind to the other parts of the world was because of word of mouth and people taking the time to teach each other things and we did this out of the kindness of our hearts it didn't really help us in any unique way except that it made us feel like we were part of something bigger than ourselves um, and when I started um, studying archaeology I realized very soon that it wasn't like Indiana Jones at all and instead I was spending a lot of time in a lab learning about the nuances about how stone tools were turned into blades and flints and this technology is super old we're talking about 3.3 million years so the oldest cave paintings are I think 50 to 60 thousand years old uh, so we were designing things a long time ago. In fact, design is the first profession of, of, of mankind, humankind. Um, and this um, design is called the Lavoli technique. It's my favorite one. It started about 230,000 years ago. And it was a special technique that cave people use to take off a shard of a rock with serrated edges all the way around. Uh, and it relied on things like trigonometry and making sure you didn't break your fingers while you were trying to do it, because I don't know if you've ever tried, but breaking a rock into two rocks is actually really hard. Um, and it creates these really strong blades that you can stab things with without losing the blade. You can also make little ones and put them on the end of arrows and, and kill things from a distance. And this gave us the ability to store nutrition in a, in a much more uh, productive way. And then we were able to use the extra brain power we had while we weren't farming and chasing food to come up with new solutions uh, for our problems. And we then went on an, a, an exponential trajectory all the way till today where we have a new kind of tool that we hold in our hands. And an interesting thing that kind of troubles me is that the new tool is something that we're all staring at all the time but the stone tools the things that we used uh, in, in, in early man days were just things that were invisible to us we held them in our hand and they extended our physical selves but they didn't take our full uh, concentration because if I spent all the time looking at this thing I might just get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger uh, but now we've got phones and we live in a fairly safe environment we we aren't afraid so we're just staring all the time at our devices and running into traffic and kind of <laughs> getting into trouble uh, and I call it the, the future, but um, I'm worried because when I look around the world and I see people, I'm, I'm seeing the zombie apocalypse. Uh, it's not going to come like in, in some of those movies. It's, it's happened already. We are all zombies in this room and we're not human anymore, which is why it felt a little weird to smile at the person next to you just before. Um, and no matter where I look, I see this over and over again. Like this is a marketing material for device connectivity. This looks like a nightmare to me. Um, this was a real photo taken of people at a cafe. Boring. Uh, no matter where you go, there's just people looking down like zombies, just like walking like this. Um, and it just keeps going. There are phone lanes in China in a place called Chongqing. Um, 
because it's annoying people so much that they're walking behind zombies, so they have to have lanes for zombies and lanes for normal people. Um, and in Augsburg in Germany, they've put traffic lights on the road before you cross so that you don't run into the tram and die because you've been looking at your device. So if governments, who are typically laggards anyway, start spending money on this stuff, it's because people have died. So um, this is a real problem, and it was by design. It's not an accident. And we know that it's not an accident because we can look at some of the marketing materials that the big companies create and understand exactly what's happening. Microsoft wants us to live in this world. They want us to sit inside of our little cages uh, staring at low-resolution versions of Skype on the wall. Um, and, <laughs> and they want us to do this as, co as, as common and frequent as, as we can. They don't want us smiling at strangers in the street. Um, Apple wants this to exist. They want to us to live in a world where we have unlimited tools at our disposal that mostly don't add value but take up all of our full attention. Um, and when I think of this, I think of screaming babies and I think of technology like a baby. It's a little child and it demands our full attention and it's always screaming at us and wanting us to take care of it. And we don't know whether or not the child is screaming because it has as pneumonia or because it just wants a gummy bear. So we're giving it our full attention no matter what the scream is and, and it turns out most of the notifications and the interruptions that your devices um, give to you are, are not important. And you know they're not important because when something serious happens like uh, the World Trade Center being um, uh, destroyed, nobody was looking at their phones because the phone networks went down and then everyone went back to reality. Another way to know this is if you start having sex with people because you've got a new partner, you're not looking at your phone notifications, maybe for like three whole days and then your friends think you've died but it turns out you're just actually being a human again. Uh, so we were promised enlightenment when this app craze started and technology was um, being promised to us as, as changing our lives. But I, I myself feel like I'm drowning. And I think we all in this room feel that way a little bit too, even though we, we are addicted. And it was predicted by this really, really clever dude called Mark Weiser, who's dead. Um, but he... Uh, he wrote some papers in like the early 90s uh, that you can read online, they're free. And my favorite ones are these two, The Coming of Age of Calm Technology and The World is Not a Desktop. And you can, his website's still live, so he, you know, he was thinking long term. Um, and you can download them and they're really cool. And they kind of, if you're gonna make products, I highly recommend reading these articles and then try to use some of the things that he mentioned in your day-to-day -day lives at work making product decisions. And they are these three things. Um, if you're designing for anything in the future, especially technology, it should take as little attention from the user as possible. And this goes very far against what we hear from VCs and uh, product managers who want to increase engagement. The best tools are invisible, like this. I'm using these th glasses to see better, but while I'm using them, I'm not looking at them. They're invisible to me, and they give me an added benefit without taking away my attention from the things that I'm doing. Uh, the technology should inform us and create calm. So we do get notifications. A lot of those notifications inform us of something, but very few of them are designed to make us feel calm. Even a meditation app that I downloaded is starting to bug me constantly, telling me, you've got to meditate. And it's making me feel stressed, which is the opposite of the goal of the product, which is to make me feel calm. So um, yeah, if you're designing technology, try to make sure that any decisions you make are in in a way, trying to help the users feel calm. And if you're thinking about this always, you'll start to see when you're making these decisions what you need to do. And the last one is that the right amount of technology is as little as is needed to get the job done. And this is super important because when we work for companies and we've got lots of people on the payroll and we've got lots of teams and everyone wants their idea put into a product, you end up with design by committee and you end up with the product being very bloated and it's doing a lot of things that it doesn't need to do. So I, re I recommend if you try to keep these, print them out, put them on your wall and put Mark's photo there and tell people that he's smarter than, than you and them and all of us and that he was right and this is why uh, we need to design our products this way. Uh, so there's a few high level concepts that I try to employ when I'm designing new products for companies like Google and other, other um, clients that I've had and they've given me great success. I've, I've done really well and I think it's not because I'm special, it's because I try always to implement these 
these couple of like rules and um, I'd love to share them with you. So the first is you actually need to really think about what the product is at its core. And when you get the job or when you're working somewhere or you're making a startup, it's really easy to get lost and start thinking about what the product is based on what people are telling you. And the marketing material and the mission statement is very rarely the truth. In fact, if we look at the truth, we can uh, start to see how the products are actually working on a larger scale for all of the big companies. Um, Google, for instance, their mission statement is um, organize the world's information and make it accessible. Um, but really, if we take that down to the core human need, they're trying to make us feel powerful. Because what's the point of having information? I don't care about information. What I care about is feeling like I know something and I know it faster. Um, and that makes me feel powerful and intelligent. Amazon's mission is to help people buy stuff. Now, 55% of their revenues are currently uh, in AWS, which actually makes us use, uh, we, we can use AWS to create technology, but all of us are in the business of selling stuff. So Amazon is still helping people buy stuff um, by allowing us to use their, their AWS services. But mostly um, they're not, th I mean, Alexa's job is to sell me stuff. Um, I can't think of anything else that they do. And you can see this in their product. If their product was to make your life easier, their website would be much more usable. Um, but <laughs> they're, and AWS is a perfect example of a very, very difficult to use website. Uh, Apple's um, mission is to give us access to aspirational technology. They're not in the business of just giving us access. They want us to make, uh, make us pay a high price for it and make us feel like we're better than the other people who don't have it. Uh, so every decision that they make is based on this goal and you can see that in the decisions that they make with their products. Um, Facebook's job is to make us feel connected or aware of what's going on. I can't think of anything else that they do. I mean, I know they're getting into some cool tech now, some, some special projects, but ultimately, when we interact with Facebook, the job there is to make us feel connected. There's a problem, though, in that it doesn't. It actually doesn't make us feel connected. We think we're connected, but it turns out when your mum's dying of cancer and you've got your 500 Facebook friends, none of them are on the couch with you, giving you a hug or like helping you feel better about your life. Um, most of them are off sending photos about their magical lives and trying to put filters on everything to make everything seem great. Um, Netflix is super interesting. Um, they are trying to make good quality distraction. That's all they're doing. So much so that they can't get the good quality anymore, so they've started making it themselves. Um, and they're doing a really great job of this. And you can tell that this is their mission because they could implement social and help you know what your friends are watching or do the thing that Amazon does and tell you about the actor while you're watching the program. But they're not in that business. Their business is to help you be distracted. And that's all they, that's all they want for you. And, and they're doing a really great job of it. And um, Snapchat's normalizing narcissism. <laughs> It's true, and you know that they're doing that because of the, the masks and the, um, the funny filters that you can add. Because if I take a photo of myself on a bus, I feel like a pretty, I feel like a loser. I feel like a narcissist. But if I know that I have a panda face while I'm doing it, then screw you guys because I'm a panda right now and you don't even, you don't, it, what you think doesn't matter. Um, and this has given us all permission to start taking photos of ourselves. And now when I see people doing it, I'm like, oh, they've probably got some funny filter. Um, and that's why they're a narcissist, not that they're a narcissist. So, um, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I, I, I really don't know. I, I gave it a lot of thought and this is the best I could come up with, which is feel busy. <laughs> like, feel like you have a job. Um, I, yeah. Okay, um, so the next thing I try to do once I know exactly what the core human value is that I'm trying to add is to understand the customer. So who is the customer really and what, uh, what do we think about them? Are we making this product for ourselves? Are we making it for our grandma? Are we making it for everyone? If you're using user personas, stop now. Um, and I know it's really easy to use them. It reminds me a lot of the snake oil salesmen who are selling SEO um, and still, I think, are selling SEO. User personas are a lie and um, you can't box people into these small, narrow verticals. It doesn't work. You'll be able to really target a product to a very, very small niche and it won't help you in the long run. The user persona that you should be building your products for is the entire planet, especially Australia, where I'm from. Um, so I recommend trying to figure out a way to please as many of your users as possible. And if you find that you can't, then there is a fundamental problem with the product, not with your user. So really stop with the user personas. And if your boss or someone you're working with tries to force you to do it or you get money because you do do it, um, do it and, and you know say a prayer or try to earn some karma back later because um, you're being a bigot, really. Um, know your launch landscape. Um, so... 
This one's tricky because when we make products, they generally take around a year to 18 months before we can deploy them. Uh, it's very rare that you would make something much faster than that. So right now, I want to make a product. So add 18 months from today, assuming everything goes to plan. So now I'm launching a product nearly two years from today. Then it takes about a year and a bit to get that product to be used by people. So now we're talking three years from today, maybe nearly four. And then you don't want the product to only be working for a week. You want it to have a half-life of maybe a year or two. So now we're at five to seven years from today uh, in your product life cycle. What does the world look like five to seven years from today? And do we need that product? I don't think many of the things we're making we will need in five to seven years from today. So this is a really important thing to consider when designing your product. You don't need to try to make it for seven years from today, but you need to plan it like it's a game that you want to win seven years from today. And, um, and that might mean making some concessions about the product now that help enable you in the future. Um, I've got some photos of some just bad products. Um, this one sends you a push notification when you have taken the last egg out of the egg tray. <laughs> um, so there are some, there are some real, and this, this company got a lot of funding and, um, well, much more than, but yeah, I want their money. And um, there is this Nokia is a perfect example. Nokia is dead because they were unable to think about what the landscape would be like that they were launching their products into. So they put a lot of effort into this weird taco phone um, and um, it turned out that it launched similar time to Apple's iPhone and I mean iPhone or taco. Um, and this is a very famous car company whose name I have removed from this slide. Um, but everyone who's ever been in a vehicle that they have bought or rented has dealt with this shit show um, when we all have smartphones. So the majority of these satellite uh, GPS terrible things that car companies uh, design is replaced with a suction cap, which we then put our phones on. So why are these car companies spending this time to launch this um, kind of horrible products? In fact, Google Auto still cannot get from the car providers whether or not the car is in motion through the API because the car providers are re really greedy and that they're, they're manufacturing wanting to control all the data. Um, and this isn't the world that we're going to live in. So they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. And it's because they're not thinking about things in an exponential way. And I want to just labor on this a little bit more because exponential thinking is really hard for humans to do. And we can't do it naturally. I can't do it. No one can do it. We have to put systems in place to ask ourselves the right questions at the right time to make sure we're applying an exponential lens to our thinking. Um, and one example right off the gate that we can use to try to understand just how crazy exponentials are is the 30 steps problem. Some of you maybe have heard this, but essentially if I walk 30 big steps, um, I don't have like a meter but let's pretend that I was tall and hunky and that I could walk 30 steps in 30 meters um, uh, and that would be a linear progression of 30 meters but if I was to do 30 steps in an exponential which is every step doubling um, can anyone guess how big that is huh yeah it's um 1 billion meters um, which is about 26 times around the surface of the earth um, and we're on an exponential because we all work in information technology information technology is itself exponential in fact there is no information technology that isn't and we've been on this exponential trajectory right from the time when we were making those stone tools so it's definitely part of our lives and it's really hard for us to understand um, solar is a really good example about exponentials so when you look at this graph it looks like we're in really bad bad situation with solar. Um, primary energy consumption is all of the fossil fuels that we use to power the earth and solar is this small line on the bottom. So we're about there with a little curve. Um, but if we apply exponential thinking to this problem and solar is on an exponential trajectory, um, we can see that we're only six doublings away from having solar completely surpass our fossil fuel reliance on the planet earth. Um, and in fact, with the solar technology that we have today, we would only need an array this big to power the entire planet. That's not including the exponentials that we just showed on the slide before. So solar is going to replace a lot of the problems that we have with fossil fuel reliance. And I can imagine there are many companies out there today trying to figure out new ways that have a seven year life cycle to get oil out of sand. Um, but if they were thinking exponentially, they would not be trying to solve this problem. We would just be waiting, waiting it out. Um, 
This graph is also super interesting. It's the slope of enlightenment or chaos and amazement. Most products that we have today are just left of this line. So we're still in the disappointment phase where we think it's going to do something that it doesn't do and it lets us down. And this makes us feel like we're not getting anywhere because we imagine products on a linear trajectory, but on an exponential, they are often below where we think they should be until we hit the knee of the curve, which is this special moment where we start to cross over into chaos and amazement. And that's happening happening now and over the next three to five years in terms of many of the information technologies available today. Um, and that brings me to the most important part of the topic, which is AI. Uh, if your company or you are afraid of AI, you need to make up and be friends because AI is coming and it is a race and it's a race with an exponential starting line. So if you are not in the race, when the race begins, you will never get in the race no matter how fast you run. You have to be on the right side of the starting line when the gun goes off. Um, and this starting line and gun thing is happening over the next two to three years. So uh, AI is a big part of our lives working in digital. And AI is a general term. It means so many things. So I just wanted to explain what some of those things are so that we can understand it um, a little better. And um, when we say AI, it means, to many people, it means sentience or the singularity. And sure, there are people working on that, but I'm more interested in specific parts of the AI, um, uh, I guess, arsenal that gives us powers. Um, and some of those are things like automated speech recognition and natural language, which we can see with Alexa and Siri and Google Assistant. Um, Olfactory molecular identification, that's super interesting. That's like understanding smell. Not many people are working in that space, but that's something that I'm particularly interested in. Robotics, uh, so um, making robots do things instead of humans or giving us assisted um, capabilities using robotics. And then um, the brain stuff, which I think you see most value in with today's products. And that's machine learning, deep learning, uh, computational um, creativity, um, using machines to start to replicate some of the functionality of the human brain. The human brain is still the most advanced uh, technical object we've ever discovered in the universe, so we're a little ways off yet before we completely replace it. But um, I don't know if many of you know this, but Google won the game of Go just recently, um, I think last year, and they beat the world's best Go player. And the interesting thing about that wasn't that it won a board game. It was the, the type of board game that it won. It wasn't a game of chess. You couldn't brute force it by knowing what the rules were. It taught itself the rules by watching 600,000 games of Go and it was completely unassisted. They didn't tell it how to play Go. They just said, win the game. And it taught itself. Um, and the, the number of potential outcomes of a game of Go is 10 to the power of 350. Um, the universe is, um, the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the power of 18. So there are more permutations of this game than there are atoms in the universe. And we were able to win the game of Go with 48 processors and nine GPUs. So it was quite affordable. <laughs> I mean, it was still really cool, but um, that was the first time that we've seen AI do something that humans um, cannot do. And um, the interesting thing, I think it was game number two, move 71, um, the, the AI did something that a human would never do. And in fact, even to this day, we don't understand why it made that move but it was a move that made it win the game and it kind of overturned 400 years of the rules and methodology behind this so we're entering this new paradigm where AI is starting to surpass us in its capability of making cognitive decisions to the extent that we ourselves have no capability of ever understanding it and um, when we're making our products we need to be aware that we're, we're making products in a world that will be run by things like this be run by systems that are able to take take over and take control um, another important thing is to know your device landscape. So I, I want to make decisions and say, but what about my user's battery? Well, that's going to get a lot better in about a year to two years. Uh, what about the, the device? You know, they've only got one. Well, we're kind of going to end up with, I actually, once I made this slide, I, I found another, another report that said we're going to have 200 billion connected devices by 2025. Um, which is like 26 devices per person connected to the internet. Uh, and if we don't, as designers and product people in this room, start making decisions on behalf of our users, trying to inform them and create calm, we're going to end up with 10 to the 26 notifications bugging us. And I'm going to come home and my fridge is going to yell at me, my toast is going to yell at me, everything's going to yell at me. Um, so try to understand what the device landscape looks like in the future. And y we don't know what it will be, but just imagine you're, a desi you're designers, you can do this, you're creatives. Imagine what it could be. Do what the Jetsons did and Star Trek did and start to like think ahead and think, okay, well, 
if the future is this, what would that look like and how would my product or my problem be uh, in that future? Uh, and know what's happening to your users in real time too. So instead of making user personas, try to design your products around understanding what your users are thinking and feeling right now. And this is within the realm of possibility. In fact, there's a new startup, um, well, it's two, two grads came out of Carnegie Mellon University and they've made a new sensor. Um, and it's like, it costs $9 to make. It's about that big, you can plug it into a USB port and it starts listening it listens to all these different signals and uses machine learning to understand what's happening in a room. And it's exquisitely accurate. So it's able to, with one of these little sensors inside of a room, able to understand what this dude's doing. He's turning on the tap, he's turning on the, he, he, the, the oven, he's opening the microwave, um, he's writing on a whiteboard, and it's doing it in real time. So imagine your products being able to tap into an API or an SDK or something that gives it access to this real-time knowledge of your user. And instead of bugging someone while they're about to walk out the door, you can bug them when they're on the toilet, like, or when they flush the toilet. Um, and in this case, it was able to understand what was happening with the microwave, that the microwave door had been opened, that something was being cooked at what temperature, and then that the microwave door was closed. This technology exists today. So imagine what will look like in about 18 months when this is normalized and being used by big players. You'll be able to design your products understanding how your customers are interacting with their real world in real time. Uh, and it's important to realize that we don't know what we don't know. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is from Socrates, which is, wisest is she who knows she knows not. In fact, he said he, but I'm trying to be like gender neutral about this. So, um, wisest is she who knows she knows not. I'm not saying women don't know things. I'm saying we all... <laughs> I'm saying we all don't know things. Um, and, um, and if we don't know, how do we find out? And machine learning is a, a really unique way of finding out some meaning in, in, a, in the chaos of the data that's around us. Um, so I like this, like the robots of, of the world can start to enlighten us and give us the signals we need to understand exactly what's happening with our users. Um, uh, one interesting thing uh, that's kind of just becoming very popular right now is generative design. Uh, so this was done, it's called Dreamcatcher, and there was a TED talk about it just recently and it blew my mind. Um, they wanted to understand the best way to make a drone, and rather than just ha sit down with a designer and the designer c say, well, I'm experienced, I know how to make drones, uh, they analyzed the this the 3D structure of every drone that's ever been made, including other things that fly like mammals and birds. And it figured out the best way and the lightest way to make a strong drone structure that would fly. And in the end, it looks like the pelvis of a flying fox, which is a, like a little possum. And I thought that that was really cool. So this is an example of how we were able to use artificial intelligence and deep learning to understand uh, a problem that we ourselves only know a little bit about. But if we were able to amalgamate the knowledge of all mankind, um, we could come up with a much better solution. And design the future that you want and don't listen to VCs. Uh, because um, <laughs> a lot of the time when we get design feedback from people who are not product designers, uh, we're getting feedback from people who are looking backwards about the things that they've experienced in the past and also looking at the problems that they have today. So use your intuition and make sure that if you are going to design um, products or problem solutions in the future, don't be limited by looking backwards always. And um, and I, I put the VC line in here um, because I've just met a lot of VCs and I'm really interested to find out that m many of them don't actually understand product and don't un understand exponential thinking. So if your business is funded or being influenced by decision makers who are more on the finance side, um, Finance is largely going to be replaced by AI very soon. So um, it's in their interest to slow things down. What's that, sorry? Coding as well. Design too. We're all out of the job. Um, so I would be getting into emotional design or psychotherapy if I was you. Um, and um, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, a reasonable person adapts themselves to the world. An unreasonable person persists in trying to adapt the world to themselves. Therefore, all progress depends on an unreasonable person. And that's by George Shaw. So uh, I think that's the end. Um, and yeah, I'd love to answer questions if you have any. Cool. I went at light speed, so. So you almost already answered my question, but um, you gave a framework of three points uh, that were, according to you, 
uh, the criteria to have a, a great product, I think. So it should keep people calm. Yeah, I'll show you. It should be simple, right? And something else. Um, yeah, that one. Yeah. Do you have any product as of today that would fit that framework? Very few. Can you give them? Um, there is an app called Headspace. Um, that one helps me a lot, and I think it's trying to do that. It doesn't bug me with push notifications. There's another app called Calm that does bug me. Um, but yeah, I, I really can't think of any, and I think it's because we are all in a we're all really bad at doing this um, because we're being influenced and pulled and pushed by by other sources of power that want us to do things with our products. Um, but I think some of the early Apple products, like the first iPhone, was maybe getting close to this. Um, you could turn it on and unbox it in like four steps. Now it's 71 steps um, to, de to get an iPhone to work. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it will rely on people like you in this room making products this way for us to increase the number m from more than me being able to name one. Yeah. I think the era of hoping that Apple will do the right thing is behind us. Um, so, yeah, just w like you're in dongle hell right now. So we have to get to a point where we don't have any more dongles before we can expect that the watch. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've had a oh. question for a while. I, want there is I won't forget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I'm wondering, actually, how do we how do you see incentives changing? Because basically, um, even with AI, we get more capabilities and obviously things get faster and exponential and all that. Mm -hmm. But if the incentives are still around yeah, revenue, money, whatnot, I mean, I think it's very hard to get to this place mm -hmm. or this type of thinking mm -hmm. that you're proposing. So how do you see these incentives? 24% of all Google searches right now are done by voice, which means no ad and no display. Google's cannibalizing their own revenues to a fact, like to a quarter, to do the right thing by a customer, um, because they know that if they don't, Alexa or someone else will do it. Um, so I think the incentive is losing customers. And as we start to enter this epoch of having AI traffic cops that start to funnel and filter information for us, um, then organizations will have more incentive to do the right thing because if they don't, they will be ignored. And a perfect example of this is your email. 66% of all emails are never opened because most of it is spam and junk and bills and things that you don't actually need. Um, so if an organization knows that they can't email you anymore, then they have to find another way. And if that other way is being managed by a traffic cop that you own in your pocket that manages your life, um, then it becomes much more about, okay, well, when is the right time and what is the right way to really help this person? Because we're going to be in the business of helping people, not bugging people. Um, and those organizations that don't embrace this will fall away and turn into Nokia's and, the, you know, the things of the past. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, and that was a great talk, so thank you. Oh, um, I had a variant on the exact same question, so I'll ask sort of a follow-up, which is that it sounds like in the future that you imagine there is a space for companies like yours that are interposing themselves between human beings and services, and then maybe also for services that people pay for. Mm -hmm. Do you see a future for uh, ser <coughs> services or publications, be that newspapers or websites or apps or anything that operate on the current model? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if you've searched for something in the last year or so and instead of getting a website that's made by that provider, you got a knowledge card from Google with the answer. Like I Googled, how do I bake baked potatoes? Um, and the answer came back to me. It was served out by a cooking website, but there was no ad and Google just gave me the answer. And I chose to read that and move on to baking my potatoes. I didn't open the website and read the exact same information. So I think we will end up in a space where aggregation of this content becomes mainstream and normalized, um, where providers like news, I mean, it's happening right now. Most news is written by people who work as aggregators for news providers, and then they sell this news article to many different news um, providers. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but the answer, I guess, is no. I don't want to live in that world, and I, if I do, I want to destroy those, those companies. Yeah, so uh, technology and the web is in its adolescence. It's like uh, going through puberty, and it's moody, and it wastes our time, 
and it doesn't always give us what we want. Sometimes it surprises us and makes us think, wow, you're going to grow up to be a really responsible human. And sometimes we think, why the hell are you in my life? Um, but when it gets through puberty and it goes into its, its adulthood, um, I think it will be a very different beast. Yeah. I have two questions. One yeah. is, how did you choose your tech stack for another AI and w which libraries did you choose and why? And then the second one is, what was the point when you decided, I'm going to leave Google and do AI outside of Google? Yeah, um, so Google has a problem. They're a really great company, uh, and they make really amazing technical advancements, but they're staffed by geniuses, and all of the engineers are geniuses. So when a product designer comes in and says, I want to build this, and I think it should work this way, um, we experience pushback from the geniuses. And it's very hard to argue with a genius because I'm not as smart as these people. Um, but they're geniuses at their vertical, and I'm good at what I do. And um, yeah, so that Google doesn't necessarily make good consumer products. They buy them. And that's because they create a technical innovation and then go shopping for the consumer layer. And they buy these things at great expense. So it occurred to me, well, I'll just make that one and then sell it back to Uncle Larry. Um, <laughs> And in terms of the technical stack, I'm using everything that Google provides so that it's easy to sell it to Uncle Larry. Um, and at the moment, I'm particularly interested in Kubernetes. Um, and um, I don't want to go too much detail of the tech stack because there are a lot of designers in the room. But I can talk to you about it more afterwards. Hi. Uh, could you share a little bit more about your perspective of over personas? Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> But could you share a little bit more why yeah. and Good. what do you do instead? Mm -hmm. um, my grandma is a hacker and her name is Cell Nan, which stands for Cellular Nana. She's like 85 and she can tell Ned into a box so that she can pretend she's in South Dakota to play canasta with her friends. Um, so if we were to create a user persona and say that my grandma wouldn't understand how to tell Ned into a box, we would completely remove her from our, our profile. Um, and it, it's really profiling. It's a great way to make decisions fast, but you end up isolating people and turning them into less than people. Um, and racial profiling is a perfect example um, of how damaging that can be. Um, and I'm not saying that we're racially profiling our users with user personas, but in a sense, we sort of are when we say, oh, he is a middle-aged white male who works in finance, has two devices, and has a median household income of blah, maybe has two kids and was educated. We're really, we're really creating a profile here that, that locks out everyone else and maybe pleases him. But it turns out, even though we targeted him correctly, he's still at home playing Angry Birds on his iPhone or using a Blackberry and not understanding technology. So th in the long run, we, we make big mistakes using user personas and we're cheating by not just solving the real problem. And the real problem is, given that human beings are unique and diverse, and given that we are all individuals, what is the common thread that we can use here to solve this problem in a way that pleases almost everyone? And most of the time, if you've got the resources and the ability, you can find that answer. And they're the great products. Yeah. My, my four-year-old niece can use an iPhone, and so can my grandma. And that's, I mean, the old iPhone. Maybe the new one's really hard for her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does that apply to, um, like, if you're solving business problems as well for business users, not just consumers? What would your take on the persona? Um, yeah, just because that? I work in a business, I, like, I worked for a big uh, investment bank in Australia, um, helping them bring themselves into the future. They were lagging behind. Um, and I heard this a lot, which was, our customer is blah, and they have this much money. And um, when we really looked at the data, it turned out that most of their customers were, in fact, these middle-aged white men with lots of money married with two kids who were university educated but within that community they were vastly um, different in their approach to technology so some were like super advanced and would understand how to do things in terminal on a machine and then some were super laggards who didn't even have they had a Nokia 3210 and they were doing all of their banking um, using a Windows machine with one running Windows 3.4 in Alta Vista or something so like even though we were targeting business people, within that cohort, we were really dealing with a wide array of humanity. And I think that's like more important there. And they were playing Angry Birds. So many, so many business people play Angry Birds.
Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, big round of applause before, Thanks. and yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you.